Thank you, Ringers, for centering us so well for this time of worship. As we begin the season of Easter, the 50 days that follow the resurrection, our scripture readings focus on how we are to live as Easter people, as those who continue to follow the teachings of Jesus. Last week, with our pews full and the sanctuary rich with the aroma of spring flowers and the rafters vibrating with gorgeous music, the air crackled with excitement as we recalled the arrival of the disciples at the empty tomb. But this week, we encounter Doubting Thomas, the one that we haughtily deride when he demands proof of the resurrected Christ. Perhaps there's something rich that emerges when we dare to express our doubts and ask questions rather than blindly subscribing to doctrine. Is the author Anne Lamott correct when she says the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's certainty? Please rise and body our spirit to the call to worship. Thomas said, unless I see the nails in his hands, put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into the side, I will not believe. We are in a liminal space, confused between brokenness and new opportunities. Dear God, fill us with the power of resurrection to embrace newness. We are hiding like the disciples behind closed doors with fear and doubt, waiting for the, your appearance. Come into our midst now and penetrate our closed hearts to fill them with your peace. Refresh and empower us, O oh God. As we worship today, blow into us your gentle spirit. Please be seated. Following that first Easter morning, the disciples hid in fear behind closed doors. And it's likely that many of us would have done the same had we been there. We'd like to think that we would have been brave and determined like the women who held tight to their faith. But the truth is, we'll never know. What we do know is that Jesus came back for all of us, not just the few who maintained their faith and stayed with him until the end. He came back for the cowardly and the greedy, for the woman in the garden and for the disciples hiding in the upper room. He came back for those who betrayed him, those who believed immediately, and for Thomas, who needed to see things for himself. He came back for you and for me. So let us join together in a prayer of confession, knowing that no matter how strong or weak our faith, Jesus lived, loved, and returned for us. Let us pray. Loving God, we confess that we are more doubters than believers. We doubt your love for us when we see oppression, sickness, death, violence against nature, wars, and hatred against each other. Help us to recognize these outcomes of our selflessness, greed, and the evil spirit of dominance. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, help us to understand your abiding love for us so that we may love one another. Help us to learn of the courage of Jesus to take up the cross to stand against oppression. 
enlighten us as we celebrate the resurrection that enables us to rise again and again to overcome injustice and create peace in this world. Amen. Friends, God love awaits us. It has been lavished upon us as a gentle spring rain, refreshing our souls, opening our hearts, and healing our wounds. Thanks be to God that we rest in God's eternal love. Amen. After having encountered Mary at the tomb in the morning, Jesus appears to the disciples for the first time that same evening. In this passage from the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus finds his followers, the ones whom he is relying on to continue his ministry, locked in a room in fear. Listen as Jesus responds to them, drawing them from their place of refuge. When it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced, and when they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. 
reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that they may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. As many of you know, I didn't grow up going to church regularly, but when we began taking our children to church so that they would have a solid Christian education, we were blessed to have a pastor like Janiel Wilson. Because after growing up, feeling that I wasn't really worthy to be in church because I hadn't been a member all of these years, Janiel taught me that it was okay to have questions, to not understand, to have an opportunity to learn. I remember really specifically one day early in our time there at a Sunday school class during which we were reading the third chapter of Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve, and someone read the line in the Bible that says, the husband will rule over the wife, and I just gasped. And before I knew what happened, I blurted out, no way. <laughs> and then I put my hand over my mouth and I thought, oh my gosh, they're gonna throw me out. Luckily, everyone laughed pretty much as you all did. And in that Sunday school class, over time, I came to realize that it was a safe space to ask questions. In fact, in one session, I remember we sp had spent some time asking, could Jesus have been married? Could he have been gay? Did he ever have children? All kinds of questions were able to be brought to the fore in this safe space. Most of them we couldn't answer fully, but we had the chance there to think about things deeply. That place, that church, was the place where I began to sense my call to ministry. I realized that I could doubt, I could ask questions, I could learn more and more and still be accepted. And I was so excited about that, that I wanted to make this a part of my life for the rest of my time. So given all of that background, you can imagine how much I love Thomas. What a contrast it is, though, isn't it? From what so many think about Easter Sunday, after the crucifixion, those terrified disciples hiding away in the upper room, and then Jesus comes and everyone has this sense of joy and unshakable faith. Everyone, that is, except Thomas. Because everyone thinks that faith is going to work just like that, that Jesus appears and all is well. And Thomas comes and shares his doubts and his questions, his disbelief, his belief that he cannot be satisfied until he gets first-hand reports and doesn't have to rely on what others have told him. I find it interesting that we're often so quick to criticize Thomas because I wonder if maybe we need to make more room for people like him. How many of you are like him? How many of you are like I was those years ago, afraid to ask questions for fear of criticism and judgment? Here's another gift that Janiel gave us. When our kids became teenagers and didn't want to go to church anymore, Janiel said, you know, I think that's okay. 
I think it's okay because if kids keep coming to church and never take time to question all that they've been told, they never internalize that faith and make it their own. Sometimes we need to step away for a minute, take time to explore and figure all of this out on our own, so that when we come back, our faith is deeper and more internalized. That was really helpful instead of having to argue with kids every single Sunday morning. And you know, it helped me to understand that when we question our faith, rather than simply believe what we're told, we develop this more mature faith. This rigorous, vibrant faith comes from a freedom to ask questions and to wonder, to doubt and be curious. You've probably heard me say over these last years, that I'd rather be a pastor of a church of 50 people who are truly engaged and take their faith seriously than a pastor of a church of 500 people who just show up on Sunday, go through the motions, and go on back home. Making space for an authentic encounter with God is what truly makes faith meaningful in my point of view. So many people just show up at church for the sake of showing up. They find comfort in a place where they can pray and find community and not have to think too deeply about what they believe. And you know, that's not wrong or bad. It's just not taking faith as seriously as I think Thomas shows us he chose to do. We tend to look at Thomas with derision. But he's really only asking for what he needs. Unlike so many of us who choose to recite doctrine and accept and repeat words that were told by the, truth, by the church without really understanding them. For example, how many of you have sung God in three persons, blessed Trinity? How many of you understand what that means? If you do, come and talk to me afterwards, because i got to tell you, I kind of get the concept, but I can't really understand it fully. Jesus died to save us from our sins. We've been saved. Have you been saved? Those are other questions that I don't know that we fully understand. We repeat them because those are words we've been taught to say in church and the one that gets me the most. When someone has died and we can't really understand why, people will come up and say, I think God just really needed them in heaven. You know, that's not a God I want any part of, my friends. There's so much about our faith that we can't fully comprehend, that we may never fully comprehend, but we certainly won't if we don't doubt ask questions, become curious, dig deeper. The reality is that Thomas spoke up when so many others chose to be quiet, quiet in the face of injustice, quiet when faced with discrimination, quiet when they witness someone being abused. Someone else will say something we often think as we sit back with our mouths closed quiet when someone can't breathe, quiet when someone's rights are being trampled because their gender expression is different from the norm. Whether in shame, in guilt, in fear, keeping quiet, we wait for someone else to risk speaking up. But Thomas dares to raise the questions, to express the doubts that so many others of us feel. He's the one who speaks up when the rest of us are silent. So I wonder if, rather than scorning Thomas, we should celebrate him for his courage to speak about what he needs. He just wants to get what Jesus promised and what all of the other disciples got, a chance to be with Jesus, a chance to abide with Jesus always, just like Jesus said we would have the opportunity to do. Maybe 
Instead of casting sideways glances at Thomas, we might aspire to be more like him. Ask our questions. Express our wonder. Talk about our doubts. Be curious. Make our faith something deep and authentic and our very own. So this morning, I encourage you, my friends, to be more like Thomas. I want to give you the courage and the gift that Janiel gave me, the encouragement to speak up, to ask questions, to risk doubting. Because I do believe that Anne Lamott did have it right. The opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's certainty. So doubt away, my friends. Amen. Holy One, who is and was and ever will be, who makes all things new, remind us that the miracle of the resurrection was not only for us, but for everyone. You call us together as a community to love, support, serve, and share with one another, yet we hesitate to loosen our grip on that which we hold dear. Guide us forward with hope and purpose that we might offer the message of new life throughout the world. May your peace, mercy, and love be made known to all people as you send us out from our hiding places with strength and power, ready to continue Jesus' ministry in the world. Today we pray for those named and unnamed in need of your care and healing touch. For those who live with the ravages of war in Ukraine and in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where nearly three quarters of a million students cannot attend school, closed due to conflict and violence. We pray for more than 100 people, including 20 children, who were killed this week in Myanmar by a military junta that bombed their village, and by all those being affected by the outbreak in Sudan. In this country, our prayers continue for those coping with the effects of extreme weather, especially the flooding victims in Fort Lauderdale, and the overwhelming number of people mourning those lost to senseless mass shootings. May we find the courage to take action to end this carnage. Our knowledge of you has been shaped by diverse experiences, teachings, and relationships. We move between faith and doubt, certainty and unbelief, 
and so gather here with friends and fellow pilgrims on this faith quest, seeking strength and affirmation. We like to think we can fool you with our bravado and high-flung phrases of faith. Although we disparage Thomas and his demand of proof, we know that we too waver with doubt in our heads and in our hearts. Remind us again and again that you love us not only in spite of our questions and our weaknesses, but because we dare to be honest enough to express them. Comfort us in our doubting and strengthen us in our believing. Transform us, make our lives new, and despite our fear and trembling, send us. We know that wherever we shall go, we follow the one who went before us, the one who taught us to pray, our creator who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What a gift it has been, <clears throat> excuse me, for these many months to continue to have both our carol on ringers and our, our chancel choir continue to provide such beautiful music for us, even in the absence of a regular music director. <clears throat> when I return from vacation at the end of April, we will be welcoming Harry Richardson, and I'm sure no one will be happier, maybe the, other than me, but other than our musicians. Uh, to have Harry joining us. We've been grateful for the beautiful music that people like Yoon Jung have provided for us, <clears throat> but particularly happy with our own musicians for what they've offered. While our faith may be full of doubts and uncertainties, things that we continue to question and explore, one thing that remains firm is our sense that we are blessed. So we gratefully return a small portion of that which we receive to enable us to serve others in need. Please give generously now. 
to support the ministries of this congregation so that we can continue to make a difference in the world so indeed of God's love and care. Let us receive our offering with joy. Please join together in blessing our gifts and offerings. May the gifts we offer be used to open doors closed to strangers, hands shut tight against generous giving, and hearts frozen by fears of the unknown. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, before the benediction this morning, I just want to take a moment to introduce to you Judy Bagley Bonner, who is here with us. If you can wave your hand, Judy. Judy will be leading worship next week, and for many weeks in the 13 months to come, Judy and Susie Kowalik, who you may remember meeting about a month ago, will be joining me and filling in on the Sundays that I will be taking off over these next months. Both of these ladies are delightful. We have gotten to know one another fairly well already and we are I am so looking forward to having them take care of you in my absence I will be gone these next two Sundays Judy will share worship with you next week and Susie on the 30th and now may you go from here trusting in God's promises for peace security and blessing even when they are difficult to believe may you go knowing that God's news is good news nourishing and true even when people tell you it is not and when you encounter doubt, may it help you to strengthen your belief. Know that the help of the saving Christ, the wisdom of the living God, and the support of the loving spirit will be with you every step of the way, now and always. Amen. Amen.